Good afternoon. Ooh, that was loud. <laughs> and thank you everyone for attending the 17th annual Northeast Florida Environmental Summit. My name is Jacqueline Blair and I am the president of the Environmental Law Society here at Florida Coastal. It is with great pleasure to introduce the keynote speaker. Patrick Parenteau is professor of law and senior counsel in the Environmental and Natural Resources Law Clinic at Vermont Law School. He previously served as director of the Environmental Law Center at Vermont from 93 to 99 and was the founding director of the law clinic in 2004. Professor Parenteau has an extensive background in environmental and natural resources law. His previous positions include Vice President for Conservation with the National Wildlife Federation in Washington, D.C., Regional Counsel to the New England Regional Office of the EPA in Boston, Commissioner of the Vermont Department of Environmental Conservation, and Senior Counsel with the Perkins Coy Law Firm in Portland, Oregon. Professor Parenteau has been involved in drafting, litigating, implementing, teaching, and writing about environmental law and policy for over three decades. His current focus is on confronting the profound challenges of climate change through his teaching, publishing, public speaking, and litigation. Professor Parenteau is a fellow in the American College of Environmental Lawyers. In 2005, he received the National Wildlife Federation's Conservation Achievement Award award in recognition of his contributions to wildlife conservation and environmental education. In 2016, he received the Kerry Rydberg Award for Excellence in Public Interest in Environmental Law. Professor Parenteau holds a BS from Regis University, a JD from Creighton, and an LLM in Environmental Law from George Washington University. Without further ado, Mr. Parenteau. So it's like a ship, you know, sailing around the ocean, you get all these barnacles. So you, I've been around for so long, they have to keep giving me these awards, you know. Uh, my topic for today is uh, the future of the Supreme Court um, in, in the wake of uh, Justice Antonin Scalia's unfortunate passing. And, and although I rarely agreed with Justice Scalia, I, I do want to take a moment to acknowledge um, the fact that he had a tremendous impact. Uh, not only on the Supreme Court, but sort of on the way that the United States public at large thought about the role of the Supreme Court, the role of judges, the role of law in our lives. He was a prodigious intellect. Um, he was a master stylist, and he had a rapier sharp wit. Um, I often tell my students that always ask the Scalia question whenever you're thinking about making an argument on behalf of the environment or federal government regulations or protection of endangered species ask yourself what would Scalia think because one thing is for sure I never argued a case in the Supreme Court but I watched a lot of them and if you weren't on your game uh, when he was on the bench nobody would cut to the heart of the matter quicker than Justice Scalia. And, and nobody would, would skewer you faster if you had loose thinking, sloppy thinking, if you hadn't really thought your arguments through, if you hadn't thought of everything, he would be very, very quick to point it out. And of course he did that with his colleagues on the court as well. So we're going to miss Justice Scalia's uh, intelligence. We're going to miss some of those m magnificent sayings of his like jiggery pokery and argle bargle and I will if I had to join an opinion like that I'd put my head in a bag and so forth um, but now it's time to look forward isn't it so we have a divided court or four um, we know that on the toughest social and environmental issues, uh, this court um, is very divided. There's a large gulf between the so-called conservatives on the court and the so-called liberals on the court. And that's exemplified in the most recent startling decision by the court, 
the stay issued of President Obama's signature clean power plan, 5-4 on straight party lines. Reminiscent of a case you might all remember that had something to do with Florida. I think it was called Bush v. Gore. Um, so let's think for a bit. This is a, a remarkable moment in history, and all you law students, pay attention. What's about to happen is going to change the Supreme Court for your generation, one way or another. Because the next appointment could very well shift the balance, almost certainly will shift the balance somewhat, quite a lot. That we can't know. But with Justice Scalia's departure, and with this evenly divided court, a very ideologically divided court on the toughest questions. Uh, this next appointment, whenever it is, occurs and is confirmed, will be with us for a long time. There are other justices approaching, shall we say, their mortality. And there's almost certainly going to be more vacancies on the court over the next four to eight years, which may comprise the term or terms of whoever gets elected in November. So these are, these are dramatic moments in American history, legal history, constitutional history. This is big stuff. So let's take a look first at Mr. Justice Scalia's legacy so you can begin to understand how significant this change may be. And specifically, his legacy in the environmental arena. And what I would say is probably the most dramatic area where Justice Scalia's left a mark is citizen standing in environmental cases. Access to justice. Access to the courts. And Justice Scalia had a very, very specific view of who, under Article Three of the United States Constitution, was entitled to bring before the courts lawsuits and complaints about the failure, largely, of government to perform duties imposed by federal law. And his view was simply this. If you're a regulated party, you're in. If you're a citizen group, a community group, a conservation group, you're going to play hell getting in. It was absolutely discriminatory in terms of the, the test for injury. Obviously, industries regulated by clean air, clean water, hazardous waste laws are affected. There's no question about it. Economic impact. Regulations cost money. And so, in the famous Lujan versus Defenders of Wildlife case, Justice Scalia said regulated parties are presumptively injured and entitled to challenge regulations every time. If, on the other hand, you're a community suffering from the effects of the air pollution and water pollution and arguing that the regulation doesn't go far enough and doesn't protect your family, doesn't protect your communities, doesn't protect your water supply, you had to pass through the three gates of hell to get into court. You had to show what particular interest you as an individual have. You had to show what was the geographic proximity of your use and enjoyment or your exposure to pollution, your use and enjoyment of the environment, your exposure to pollution, where precisely on the landscape, what GPS coordinates can you prove to court to show that you, at Parento, are injured by this rule? Not the public at large, not your neighbors, not the community at large, you as an individual. Show me, prove to me, how exactly are you injured by this rule right now, imminently? Show the causation between the pollution you're complaining about 
and your particular injury and prove to me that the relief that you're seeking from court will actually redress your injury, make it go away. Whole series of cases. Lujan versus National Wildlife Federation. National Wildlife Federation challenging management of public lands in the West. Who's the National Wildlife Federation? Bunch of people who like to hunt, antelope and other things, bird watch and do other things. Bureau of Land Management's reclassifying large swaths of public lands, millions of acres for oil and gas, for grazing, for mining, for all kinds of productive, extractive, environmentally disturbing activities all over the landscape. NWF challenges this on a programmatic basis. You haven't done an environmental impact statement. You haven't looked at the cumulative effects. You haven't done a good job assessing whether this classification scheme is good or bad for the environment and the people who use it, including us. And Justice Scalia says it's not enough to say you hunt antelope in Colorado, in Gillette County, Wyoming at these particular areas that BLM might be managing. You have to show me where exactly that you're hunting that BLM's reclassification scheme is going to have an immediate impact on you. In other words, an impossible test. Lujan versus Defenders of Wildlife. That's the template for environmental standing. All of you environmental law students, all of you administrative law students, all you law students, period need to know Lujan versus Defenders of Wildlife. So what did he say there? Well, he said these two individuals who submitted standing declarations said they like to go to India and look at elephants. And you're going to build a dam and, and, and destroy some of the habitat of the elephants and other endangered species. But you know what? You've only been to India twice. And you don't have a return ticket. So a sometime in the future intent to return to India to look at elephants isn't good enough. Steel Company. Justice Scalia says, I know you, you want these industries that are releasing all these toxic elements into the air and the water and the land to report them. We call it Sarah Title III. TRI, Toxic Release Inventory. Um, and so you caught this company not submitting their reports. But you know what? They've submitted them now. So the case is over. Well, wait a minute, said the plaintiffs. What about a deterrence? What about a penalty? What about enforcement? Why do we have to run around catching these people every time that they're not submitting their reports? Why don't you send a signal, a message to the industry to get on the stick and submit their reports? Well, says Justice Scalia, that's just psychic injury. No standing, no relief, case dismissed. And then Justice Ginsburg finally put a halt to this as Justice Blackman characterized it, slash and burn expedition through the law of environmental standing in laid law and said, slow down. If somebody's downstream of a discharger upstream who's violating their permit and my kids are swimming, I may not be able to prove exactly which pollutant is coming from that factory that might get into my kid's system. But you know what? I'm not having my kids swim in that river anymore. Justice Scalia would have said, no standing. Justice Ginsburg said, close enough. A reasonable concern and changed behavior in response to an obvious violation that nobody contests ought to be good enough to get this family into court to challenge the failure of this company to comply with its permit. That's laid law. Scalia took a big hit. Read his dissent. Not very nice. Not very complimentary of his good pal. You know what we call her, by the way, the notorious RBG, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. She's the one, you know, when you see the pictures of Scalia riding the elephant, she's, she's the little person behind Scalia on the elephant. Um, yeah, so he lost. He doesn't take losses lightly uh, and graciously. And so he waited for his, bided his time, and it came in Earth Island. So in Earth Island, it was one, here we go again, back to the 
how can you show me exactly where you're recreating in the national forest? Issue is forest service selling timber, cutting timber, um, not following their rules. No question about that. No question that there was a violation of law. No question that the Forest Service was blithely ignoring its own rules. No question about that. But, says Justice Scalia, we don't know exactly where the Forest Service might be violating these rules and selling timber at exactly the time when your members, Sierra Club, are recreating in that area. No standing. No standing. So. In the area of citizen access to courts, holding agencies accountable to the rule of law, protecting your communities, uh, the change going forward can only be good. No one was more adverse to citizen standing than Justice Scalia. But it doesn't stop there. How about when the conflict is between, oh, let's say, property rights and wildlife, endangered species? barrier beaches, wetlands, critical habitat. Well, property rights, uber allus. Always one. Always one. Lucas. Categorical taking. When the state of South Carolina tried to protect the last remaining barrier beaches, wouldn't we like to have a few of those back now? Categorical taking of Mr. Lucas's property, trying to prohibit development. Wasn't a very smart law, wasn't perfectly executed. But the idea that it's a categorical, no questions asked taking of land, no matter what the state was trying to protect or damage it was trying to prevent, pretty dramatic statement of property rights. In a case called Sweet Home, involving protection of endangered species under the Endangered Species Act, Justice Scalia dissented from Justice Stevens' opinion upholding a rule regulating activities that would destroy habitat of endangered species. Justice Scalia, in dissent, said this is a law that confiscates private property for zoological purposes. In Rapanos, a case involving protection of wetlands, Justice Scalia, quoting from the Chamber of Commerce amicus brief, said, this regulation approaches ruinous economic impacts on industry across America. Property rights, uber allus. Massachusetts versus EPA, the Supreme Court's landmark decision recognizing, you know what? Maybe these scientists are right. Maybe there is a problem with the amount of carbon we're spewing into the atmosphere and the oceans. And we don't know. We're not scientists, says the Supreme Court. But assuming these scientists know what they're talking about, then indeed carbon pollution poses a reasonable endangerment of public health and the environment. And so therefore we think that carbon CO2 and other greenhouse gases are in fact the kinds of pollutants, the kinds of threats that Congress intended to be regulated under the Clean Air Act. Justice Scalia dissented vigorously and during the oral argument made the statement, he got, he got the troposphere and the, and the stratosphere confused and when, when that was pointed out to him he said, I'm not no scientist, I don't, I don't know the difference between them, I don't care. And in fact, he wrote a law review article some years ago in which he actually said that right up front. I don't care. It's not my job to care. So the outcome of the case, and you know, you can look at this as originalism, textualism, judicial purity. You can look at it different ways. But his judicial philosophy, his worldview was the outcome of the case does not matter to him. In Rapanos, the question is, what are waters of the United States? You can't find a more vexed question of law than that. But he made it very simple. He said, the only word that matters to me is waters. Now, if the word had been water, different result. But the word that Congress chose was waters. 
And now I know that for 30 years, the lower courts, hundreds of decisions, have routinely upheld the authority of the federal government to regulate activities throughout the entire tributary systems of the United States. Why? Because if you want to stop pollution and discharges of pollutants, you need to go to where they're being discharged. And sometimes that's quite a ways up the watershed, quite a ways from the ocean, quite a ways from the Great Lakes, quite a ways from things that, you know, you would recognize as water. Water begins with trickles and rills and streams and wetlands, and it moves through the hydrologic cycle, and it moves through an ecosystem. And the health of that ecosystem down below depends on what happens up above. And the lower courts for three decades understood that. And so they fashioned a whole body of law recognizing that for the Clean Water Act to achieve its very clear stated objective to restore and maintain the chemical, physical, biological integrity of the nation's waters, you have to go to where the pollution is. Okay, so what does Justice Scalia make of that? Well, he says they're all wrong. And you don't get, another classic Scalia-ism, you don't get adverse possession of the law. The fact that hundreds of judges over three decades had read this act a certain way did not matter one bit. The word waters, says Justice Scalia, means what I say it means. And it means relatively permanent bodies of water like lakes and rivers and oceans. More recently, and now we're getting closer to what can we anticipate going forward. Let me, let me, let me also stop and acknowledge a couple of outliers. Because Justice Scalia, although his overall legacy is unremittingly negative on the environment, you never can tell with him. So there are two very distinctive decisions he reached that are pro, if you will, the environment. One, American trucking. Unanimous decision. He wrote it, upholding EPA's authority to regulate ozone and smog and other bad stuff. And in the course of regulating that stuff, the question was, well, should you consider cost? I mean, shouldn't you sort of weigh the benefits and the cost? I mean, if you're just killing really old people, what's the big deal? They're, they've lost their economic utility. You know, I'm getting to that point, so I identify with this. And if you think I'm, if you think I'm making this up, go look at OMB's regulatory analysis guidelines on how they value human life. And I can tell you this, the older you get, the less you're worth. So why not draw the line at, I don't know, 65? So um, when that issue came to the Supreme Court with industry arguing you ought to be doing a formal quantitative cost-benefit analysis before you start setting these outrageous standards protecting these really old, sick, feeble people, um, Justice Scalia said, no, I don't see the word cost in the statute. Textualism. It worked. Another case, city of Chicago wants to burn their trash. Um, waste to energy, we used to call that. Still do in some places. Um, and so the question was, yeah, but what about the stuff in the bottom, the fly ash, which is loaded with heavy metals? Very, very bad stuff. Selenium, mercury, lead, chromium. Nasty, 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 nasty. Well, says the city of Chicago, it started out as garbage and garbage it remains. So, no, it's not going to be a hazardous waste. That'll kill our waste to energy uh, facility build out. And we're getting really tired of buying landfills. And we'd really rather burn this stuff and stick it in the ground. And recycling is a pain in the ass, and so on. So, um, that was the issue. Is the bottom ash still garbage? Or is it now hazardous waste, which has to go to a Title IV facility? Ooh, very expensive. Justice Scalia said, it's hazardous waste, period. Sorry, it's going to cost a lot. It's hazardous waste. 
But now, later in his life, in his tenure on the bench, he was there 30 years, one of the longest serving judge justices ever. Um, he comes up on a couple of more recent cases, UARG, Utility Air Regulatory Group. This is the case that reviewed EPA's first carbon regulations of power plants. And this particular case involves something called a PSD, Prevention of Significant Deterioration Permit, Pre-Construction Permit, for facilities being built in an areas that are already achieving air quality. And before you stick something into an area that's clean, you take a look at it. And if this facility is emitting criteria pollutants, SO2, carbon monoxide, lead, particulates, that sort of stuff, if it's emitting these things we call criteria pollutants, national ambient air quality pollutants, of a certain level, over 100 tons or 250 tons, depending on what kind of facility you are, well, if you have to get this permit for those kinds of pollutants, then you also have to look at their greenhouse gas emissions, since chiefly carbon dioxide. So EPA said, even if you're only emitting carbon dioxide and greenhouse gases, we still want to regulate you as a PSD facility. Justice Scalia said no. No, I don't see that in the statute. Uh, you would be regulating everything, including Dunkin' Donuts, under that kind of an approach, because everybody emits a lot of carbon dioxide. So no, I'm not going to let you do that. But if a source has to be regulated anyway, and we call them anyway sources, then yes, you can require what's called BAC, Best Available Control Technology, for the greenhouse gases. Good luck with that, of course, because what do you do with carbon? You know, you don't scrub it. You know, you don't filter it. You got two things to do with carbon. Put it in the ground or put it in the trees. In other words, biological sequestration or geological sequestration. That's it with carbon. It's got to go back into the cycle one way or another. It's got to stay out of the atmosphere. You can't bury it. You can't put it in a bag. Those are the only two things you can do. So Justice Scalia says, well, all right, I'm going to give you enough authority for these sources that you can look at these best available control technologies. But he starts wagging his finger. And the balance of his opinion is all about wagging his finger. Don't you try to go too far, EPA. Don't you start talking about LED light bulbs in the cafeteria type stuff. I've got my eye on you. I don't want no elephants in mouse holes out of this. He's clearly signaling he knows a much bigger rule is coming. And he's putting his marker down big time in UARG saying, don't try to push this Clean Air Act authority very far. I don't think carbon's a pollutant anyway. I disagreed with everybody else on mass versus EPA. If I get another shot at this, watch out. Then we had Michigan versus EPA most recently last term. The mercury rule, a neurotoxin. One of the most dangerous air pollutants we have, a global air pollutant. Biomagnifies up through the food chain as methylmercury. Very bad stuff. And the statute is silent on whether you consider costs in deciding whether to regulate mercury. That sound familiar? Silent on the question of cost. Says where it regulated, where appropriate. Gives the EPA authority to look at new emerging threats to public health and regulate them where appropriate. And so EPA says, well, yeah, we think it's appropriate to regulate mercury. Uh, it's causing. Uh, fetal abnormalities in a lot of nursing mothers. So yeah, I think that's at least one good reason um, to regulate mercury. There may be others. Um, it's not a good idea to eat fish that have a lot of mercury in them unless you know how to fillet them just right. So I think we'll go ahead and then start the rulemaking process. We understand this is going to be expensive. How expensive? Nine billion dollars. So we, we know this is going to be an expensive hit for the coal industry. Um, but our idea, you see, is think about cost when we come to imposing specific technology standards on specific sources, categories, subcategories. Be nuanced. Be specific. Have real information about what technological approaches are feasible in certain cases and not in other cases. 
a more graduated, calibrated approach to the question of how do you consider cost? No, said Justice Scalia. If the statute is silent on cost, then it means cost should be considered. So um, the thing that angered Justice Scalia in the Michigan case is a certain element of the industry appeared at the oral argument and said, um, we're already complying with this rule. We've spent billions. We represent 70% of the regulated industries. Under no circumstances do we want you to throw this rule out. Maybe we didn't like it to begin with, but at this point, having sunk this much money into it, we're not too excited about the idea of saying, oh, never mind. So the court did not vacate the rule, which under normal circumstances they would. They remanded it to fix this problem of the cost, which is pure form, pro forma. It's not going to change the rule. The lower court also said we're not going to stay the Mercury rule. But it was pretty clear that Justice Scalia was very angry with EPA, not happy that he had been hamstrung by the fact that the industry had already complied largely and was gunning for the next rule coming down the pike, which, of course, is the clean power plan. So let's now think about a 4-4 court. A couple of quick things about cases on the docket to keep an eye on, to see how this current situation, which looks to me like it could continue for a long period of time. You will hear Obama now nominating the governor of Nevada, a moderate Republican, Governor Sandoval, was on the federal bench for a couple of years, unanimous confirmation, moderate record on the environment, not bad for a Western Republican governor, for sure. Um, and we hear Senator McConnell, Senator Grassley, chair of the Judiciary Committee, saying under no circumstances will we hold a hearing, under no circumstances will we hold a vote, you can forget about that. We don't care who you nominate. And McConnell basically said just that. It doesn't matter who you nominate. This is a decision that should be made by the next president, ele duly elected by the American people, not the president the American people duly elected in 2012. Now, they, they may back off, right? They're going to pay a price for obstructing this. They're going to pay a price. Question for them, the Republicans in, in command of the Senate, is do we, which, where do we pay the bigger price? From confirming an Obama nominee or from obstructing an Obama nominee? So that's their calculation. Good luck with that. Uh, the Democrats only need five votes, five seats to, to flip the Senate. There are seven in play. One of them is right next door to me in New Hampshire, Senator Ayotte. She came out full bore in favor of no hearings, no confirmation. They did a poll. 48% of New Hampshire switched their votes from pro wanting Ayotte reelected to anti. So watch out. Watch out, Republicans, because you could lose the Senate over this. Maybe they don't. Let's assume that we don't get a nominee confirmed for the, this term. And we're into 2017, and we don't know who the president's going to be. We can think about that and you know, stay up all night, perhaps, thinking about that. Um, but let's just assume for the moment that we're probably going to have that vacancy through a, the balance of uh, well, certainly this year and well, well into next year. The Clean Power Plan is due to be argued before the D.C. Circuit Court on June 2nd. The panel that the government drew is just about as good a panel as they could have gotten in the D.C. Circuit. Judith Rogers, very strong supporter of EPA. Joyce Henderson, written some incredible environmental opinions, including one saying the Delhi Sands flower loving fly that exists in one county in California has a substantial impact on commerce because when you look at ecosystems as a whole, they certainly have an impact. And unless you have flies and all the other constituents of an ecosystem, you don't have an ecosystem. Wow. She's on my favorites list. 
And then the third member of the panel is Sri Srinivasan, who you all know because he's been talked about forever uh, as what people thought was the consensus pick uh, for Obama's nominee because he was unanimously confirmed to the D.C. Circuit Court just one year ago. But that's not the name that Obama's putting forward, apparently, or at least we don't know. So the D.C. panel will hear arguments in June. They've heard lots of arguments already. They denied a stay in the case earlier on. They've been, they've been seeing the issues. They've been seeing the briefs. They've been dispatching their clerks to do all the research. They're poised. They're ready. They're going to issue a decision before the end of the year is the betting, almost certainly. Which means, then, you have an interesting first question. 4-4. Four, four. Here comes the petition for certiorari from the D.C. Circuit. Let's assume the D.C. Circuit upholds the rule. Why not make that assumption? Otherwise, it's not any fun. So let's assume they uphold the rule. Let's assume they write a good opinion. Uh, all of these judges have, uh, certainly the two, old, the two judges that have been there a while, really know their way around the Clean Air Act, administrative law, constitutional law. They know all the issues inside and out. They've written lots of very detailed decisions in complex cases. Let's assume they write a really good opinion. Because I'll tell you something, EPA did one hell of a good job substantiating, notwithstanding what you may be hearing and reading in certain circles of media and punditry, EPA did a hell of a job with this rule. I ain't saying it's going to live, you know. I mean, there's no, there's no guarantees and laws. It's, it's, there's no slam dunks. It's a crapshoot. But they did everything they possibly could do to, to substantiate this rule. So you're sitting there, you're Justice Roberts, and you're sitting with your conference. Here comes the petition. It only takes four votes to grant it. What are you going to do? You go around the room, it's 4-4. Four, four. Are you going to grant it or not? Waste everybody's time or take a chance that somebody's vote can be convinced? Let's assume they grant, sir. And it does turn out to be 4-4. Four, four. What happens then? You all probably know. The lower court's decision is upheld. The government wins. Or Obama gets his nominee through and the case is argued with a new member of the court. And that member of the court is more of a pragmatist like this Sandoval seems to be. Someone who you can't right now pigeonhole and can't be sure how they'll vote. But better than Scalia, for sure. Not a Kagan. No, no. No, no. Not in that, that category. Not that smart, probably. And nobody's as smart as Kagan. Um, but uh, somebody who is gettable, a vote that's gettable. So the government's got a decent shot at an Obama nominee being confirmed as well. Um, one other rule that's coming down the pike to watch, clean water rule. Very controversial rule. Um, EPA trying to clarify the mess that the Supreme Court, thank you, Mr. Justice Scalia, created in Rapanos. What was Rapanos? A fractured decision. 414. No majority opinion. Chaos. Totally different criteria. Totally different ways of approaching the question. What's a water? The United States. How much nexus has there to be to large bodies of traditionally navigable waters? How do you take into account the cumulative effect that streams and, and wetlands have on the overall health of rivers and lakes? The lower courts, in response to Rapanos, um, have basically said, well, it's Justice Kennedy's test, which is called the significant nexus test, which is quite remarkable since it's only his test. Nobody else agreed with it. So here's the curious thing for you law students. We have a test for the jurisdictional scope of the Clean Water Act based on the opinion of one justice. That's where we are today. Nine circuit courts have ruled it's either Kennedy only or it's Kennedy certainly. A few have said, well, if you can somehow manage to squeeze yourself into the narrow little box that Scalia has created, then you're, you're in as well. But mostly what we're talking about across the land is the significant nexus test. That's the way EPA wrote the rule. They wrote it for Kennedy. They're very explicit about that in the preamble to the rule. They did their level best to try to parse every word in his lengthy concurring opinion, every nuance and every inference and every way of thinking. What, what was he thinking? What did he mean? Wetlands uh, similarly situated in the region. What the hell does that mean? So they, they worked all through every single way you could think about inside the mind of Justice Anthony Kennedy. And they wrote the rule, hoping that they did what he wanted them to do. 
So, Rapanos was this split decision. We now have a split court. The, this, this clean water rule now is pending before multiple district courts around the country and also in the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals in Cincinnati. That court just within the last few days issued a decision saying we're going to decide the legality of this rule. If that holds, and that's kind of another whole interesting jurisdictional discussion, if that decision holds, then we're likely to see the Sixth Circuit rendering a decision on the clean water rule perhaps as early as this year, before the end of this year, in which case that's yet another major environmental rule teed up for a court that's still 4-4. So I think probably I should wind this up. Um, it's a new day. It's um, a very uncertain uh, situation. Lots of issues that are already on. I didn't even talk about all the social issues. What's on the docket right now? Oh, let me think. Abortion, affirmative action, contraception, unions, immigration. All of those are cases pending in the court right now. All of those are potentially 5-4 or were 5-4 type, type issues. So we have before us a situation we haven't seen in a very, very long time, not in my lifetime, where major social environmental issues are hanging by a thread in a court that's ideologically divided um, and at this point not knowing when we're going to see that appointee, what kind of person that's going to be and, and how that's all going to play out. So all I can say is, may you live in interesting times. Thank you. Thank you Another so much. Award. <laughs> I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. I'll start over. Let's do that all day. Questions? Questions? Sir, I, I apologize, um, but you brought it up three times. Waters of the U.S. Uh, my question, from the perspective of the Tenth Amendment to the Constitution, where in the Constitution do the states convey to the United States government any ownership whatsoever of waters? Which article did they convey that? Yeah, yeah, the Clean Water Act could have been based on a number of statutory, I mean, constitutional predicates, but it's pretty much based on the Commerce Clause. Yeah. Yeah, right. Congress shall regulate commerce among the states and with the Indian tribes and foreign governments. That's it. That's the commerce, whole thing. The commerce. And it doesn't have, there is no conveyance. And every, Tenth Amendment, for those who may not have caught that, was uh, everything that the states don't give to the United States to do, we reserve to the states or the people. Yep. That's right. But... I mean, there's legions of cases upholding Congress's authority to regulate air pollution, water pollution, hazardous waste pollution under the Commerce Clause. There are limits, and what you raise is a good point, which is if there's such a thing as the states, right, as sovereigns, and there's the federal sovereignty, where does the federal sovereignty end and the state's sovereignty begin? You could, you, you could do it other way around, but with the Clean Water Act being an exercise of Congress, the way the case will come to the court, it'll be where does federal authority under the Commerce Clause end and state sovereignty under the Tenth Amendment begin? And here's the thing that's, that's vexing a lot of uh, people who look at this, including me. How do you go about drawing that line in an aquatic ecosystem? And I've asked the Federalist Society, which has had me come to their meetings oftentimes. It's a good way to get rid of old tomatoes when I, when I come. Uh, I've asked them, 
over and over again, just, just tell me how you would draw that line. Because the, the court clearly, the conservative members of the court are clearly going to be troubled by any argument that looks like there's no stopping point to federal authority, clearly. But, but how you do that in an integrated system, EPA commissioned what they call the connectivity report, and they had the National uh, Academy of Sciences appoint a special panel of all the smartest water limnologist type people, hydrologists, geomorphologists, fish squeezing biologists, all of these really, really uh, smart scientists to say, how do watersheds work? And they, they did a, multi, a well, multi-month, almost a year-long study. They synthesized all the literature. This is called a synthesis analysis. All the literature we know about watershed function and this and that and the other thing. And what they said is, surprise, it's all connected. But they did it in a very detailed way, and they showed how the functions of different parts of the watershed enable water quality to either be maintained or not maintained. It's the flow of nutrients and all this sort of stuff. So EPA, you know, you can disagree with the how they came out on it, and certainly people are, but they did at least commission the smartest people they could find to give them some scientific basis to draw some lines. And they do. This rule has, for the first time, what they call bright lines. Nothing beyond 4,000 feet of the ordinary high water mark of an otherwise navigable stream or tributary, for example. So EPA has endeavored to address your point, which is we're not claiming it's all ours. We're trying to find a way to draw some sensible lines using science. We'll see whether or not they succeeded. Yeah? I have two uh, clarifying questions and kind of just one straight question. One is, um, did the EPA take out energy efficiency from its kind of four tiers from the Clean Power Plan, and do you think that was a good move to make it through the courts? And then second, can you clarify or confirm that um, fracking is not covered under the Clean Water um, Act? Yeah. As, go ahead. And then my third is, who would be your choice for the Supreme Court? Aha, me. <laughs> oh, no. Um, Oh, yeah. I mean, I mean if, you, if you want to draft me, I, I, I can't say no. Um, as to the first, yes and yes. Yes, they took out energy efficiency as the fourth building block, and yes, that was a very smart move legally. And you know why energy efficiency is happening anyway? In fact, here's, here's, here's a point I've, I've written about. Don't repeat this anywhere. It almost doesn't matter what happens to the clean power plan. There is so much happening in the energy sector right now. So much transformation underway. The, pat the, the, the reenactment of the five-year PTC production tax credit and the ATC adjusted tax credit, or what's that called, the ATC? Yeah, that one. Those, those two, once uh, PTC is aimed at, at, at wind, ATC is aimed at solar, those two signals to the market are going to do more, in the, certainly in the short term, to promote green energy and renewable energy than the clean power plan, which is going to take a long time to fully come into, into effect. So anyway, I think it was a smart move to take the energy efficiency out. Um, your second point was fracking. fracking. Uh, there are eight exemptions from federal laws for fracking, eight. It take, would take another whole session to go over them all. The one that's most um, talked about is the one that our, our late uh, Vice President Dick Cheney got, got through with his secret task force. Uh, and it was secret. It met in secret. It, its, its minutes were not revealed. It went all the way to the Supreme Court. And oh, who was that was on the Supreme Court? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, he, and, he and Dick Cheney, Scalia and Cheney used to go duck hunting in Louisiana. So there was a whole dust up over shouldn't you recuse yourself. Scalia wrote a 20 page opinion on why he shouldn't recuse himself, even though he was about to decide in favor of Dick Cheney's task force. So there's that little footnote to history. But the, the one that everybody points to is the exemption from the Safe Drinking Water Act, which is true. It's a flat exemption. Unless you use diesel in your production process, you're exempt from the Safe Drinking Water Act. There are exemptions for oil and gas industry generally under the Clean, under the clean Water Act for what would otherwise be an industrial stormwater permit. You only need those permits 
if you have surface disturbance uh, of sediment of a certain size. But the other things, the other activities that go around the fracking operations, not subject to the Clean Water Act. If the flow back water that you get out of the well, if you're going to not reuse that, if you're going to try to discharge that somewhere, that would require a permit. What the industry has been doing in Pennsylvania until they got caught was sending it to the municipal treatment plant. Well, it turns out that when you drill down 800 meters underground in fractured granitic bedrock in, in the northeast, you know what you encounter? Radon. So the stuff that was coming up in the water after the fracking was full of radionuclides. Who knew? And when that fact was made known to the municipal treatment plant operators, they said, we don't want no more of your flowback. So I'm not sure what they're doing with flowback in a lot of places right now. Uh, but that's another uh, area where the, regulate, the federal regulations of fracking are significantly hobbled by these series of exemptions. And then you had a third point. Oh, my choice for Supreme Court. I don't know. I'm looking hard at this Sandoval guy. I mean, uh, you know, we're not going to get um, we're not going to get my choice. Uh, you know, the, the real question is, do, do we want Obama to f pick somebody who has some chance of being confirmed? And for the maybe for the sake of the institution and the nation, you know, maybe we shouldn't. As those, those of us on the left, maybe we shouldn't be so insistent that we get exactly what we want. You know, um, I think uh, you know, Kennedy's a pragmatist. Kennedy, this guy, this guy Sandoval, kind of strikes me in the Kennedy mode. He's sort of a pragmatist. He listens, open-minded. I don't know. I don't know enough about him, but probably somebody like that is what we're going to get. Any other questions? Had enough? I think. I don't think, blame you. I think you're up there. Thank you.